Did you know Spem and Allium well before you had the commission from us? Very much so. Yeah. Uh, I think I heard Spem and Allium when I was still in my teens. And uh, so it would be a 1970s recording. Have uh, you ever sung in it? No, I haven't. My, one of my daughters has, yes. and uh, she gives me great reports about what the feeling was like. It's a sort of rite of passage for choral singers, I, I think. Yes. yes. And had you ever thought about doing a 40-part choral piece before this became an idea? I think so, yes. It had crossed my mind. What I wondered what it would be like. Could it be done? Um, th there's lots of questions about writing in 40 parts, especially with a different musical language to this. And I'm sure many composers, and I know that many others have, have also written 40 part motets, ha have considered this. I mean, what kind of language in, in the modern age suits that kind of sound, that kind of complexity. When we were recording it, there was a, a real buzz, a real electricity about the work. And um, I was so excited to get the response of other musicians mm -hmm. to the work because I was in a sort of heightened state after recording it. So I sent it to a couple of um, carefully chosen people. Mm -hmm. And one of them was John Rutter. Mm. And he said, that it felt like a newborn free spirit rising from the body of Talis's spem. Hmm. And I thought that was an, a, a very elegant um, way of describing what we all felt about the work. Mm. Um, you use the same structure, so we start with choir one, followed by two, three, four, five, until mm. we're up to choir eight, and then yeah. the first tutti, and then eight back down to one, mm -hmm. and then the middle tutti. So that, that's a, a mirror of what um, mm. Talis did. Absolutely. So, so how, and as you said earlier, it's, it does have a, a sort of uh, Renaissance polyphonic feel when it, when it starts. Mm -hmm. So how did you create this newborn free spirit? It, it's, a, it's an interesting point, actually. I mean, um, when, when I, I write like this, and I, I love making that sort of historical imitation, uh, but it has to go beyond pastiche, it has to go beyond uh, your counterpoint exercises at university, which I love doing actually. My, my teacher at Edinburgh University was Kenneth Layton, and he was a, a great composer of course, and uh, loved by many uh, choral uh, singers in this country who knows music th for the liturgy. But he was a great teacher of counterpoint, especially, um, and I could feel his hand, uh, uh, um, his ghost, in fact, uh, as, as I was writing this piece. He, not, not that he was co correcting my parallel fifths and so on, but he was perhaps pointing me towards the archetype. And um, <clears throat> I think there's some, something about the modern composer that even although we, we want to write beyond pastiche, we can still make a kind of homage to these uh, great historical figures and capture something of their essence and take it into our own time. And so I, I have no problems about um, my music initially and in, mo and in certain moments sounding as if it was from hundreds of years ago. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps in more recent times, uh, composers would have had a problem with that, but I, I think that the tradition is so important. Uh, it shapes who we are. Uh, as musicians, and it shapes who we are in so many different ways, that to embrace tradition in that very overt way is something I'm very much at peace with. And uh, I, I know that a lot of my choral music especially um, points to these great masters in the past unashamedly. I mean, the, 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 they've meant so much to me in my musical journey all my life. You talked about um, being impressionistic. Yes. How does that work? Well, um, I think, first of all, um, th th there has been a tendency throughout the 20th century of many composers uh, to reference the past. Uh, Stravinsky, of course, did it beautifully in so many of his works, and even the term neoclassical uh, comes from the way that he reimagined models. So, um, in a sense, we've been given permission by the likes of Stravinsky to revisit the past. Um, but the question is, how do we take it into our own souls, how do we take it into our own personality? And uh, of course, a, a lot has happened since Talis, a lot of music has been written since Talis, and the, the great impressionists of the 19th and 20th century uh, are also composers that I love very much, and I love the way that the likes of Debussy and Ravel, perhaps, and, and even in this country, Vaughan Williams, were able to smudge the edges of um, their ancient models 
to make it uh, painterly, to make it um, impressionistic in that way. And you can do it with instruments, uh, and certainly that the Debussy and Vaughan Williams did it with or orchestral instruments, but you can also do it with choirs. So you talk about painterly, impressionistic writing. How much did the text inspire that? Very much so. Uh, I, I mean, I... Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm led by the text in, in a lot of my work, uh, even to the, the extent of the structure is made by the text. However, uh, um, because the text is quite compact, you can allow the music to go in between the words uh, and the meaning, and you can really allow the, the meaning and the implications of the text to be resonated and reverberated uh, through the, uh, the musical structure. Uh, I suppose that's the joy of, of setting words like this. Any words, um, you, the composer needs to go deep into uh, the text in a way to make, a, make something brand new out of it. And how long did the whole piece take to write? Um, From the first ideas? I, I think that a piece like this came quite quickly. I, I don't know, maybe a, a month or so. Um, uh, obviously, been, I had been thinking about it for a while, uh, ever since it was uh, discussed some years ago. Um, and I know part, part of that preparation process is just working out how you're going to go about it, um, getting to know the talus again, wondering uh, how the, the model is going to work, are you going to be faithful to the talus in, in the term of the structure, and I decided to, I wanted to do that. I wanted it to be a, a, an homage in, in a very particularly structural way. Uh, there's no quotations from the, the talus, but um, I think in the design, the way it sweeps around from one choir to the other, uh, that was very deliberate. And during the course of that, say, month of very intensive work, um, at what point was the greatest challenge and at what point did you feel, right, I've, I've really nailed this now? I think the challenge, uh, or the, the, the greatest sense of anxiety in, in writing of the piece is actually before you begin. Uh, it's in the years <laughs> leading up to it, when you wonder how on earth you're going to do it. Um, um, that's when you feel the challenge, and I suppose there's a kind of um, subconscious preparation of how to deal with the challenge in those years and months as you... You're not necessarily thinking about it in the front brain all the time, but it's... it's um, it's kind of just stating away in the background uh, as you approach it, trying to work out technical um, solutions to the challenges, uh, the technical challenges of, of writing such complex music. Um, but, but doing your research at the same time, seeing how the great masters did it in the past. So by the time I came to actually put pen to paper and start moving the notes around about the page, in a sense the challenges had been met. I'm very interested in, in choral composition in our times, I mean, in this very decade, and um, the, the, the liberty that composers have now to write tonally, atonally, post-tonally. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is something you could have done with such confidence, um, say 30 years ago, 20 years ago? I don't think so. No, something has happened in British musical culture uh, where choral music has come into, a, into the vacuum. Um, that has been left by modernism. And when I was a, a young composer studying in Edinburgh and then at Durham with John Caskin, um, the, the, the rise of the new British choirs was not on the horizon. It's been an unforeseen miracle in many ways. Um, when I wrote, when I was writing my, my early music, it was all instrumental music. And I love doing that, I still love writing for instruments. Um, but in a, in a sense, in a real true sense, we've been given permission by the various choirs that have come forward in the last 20 years uh, to divert our attention to the choir, um, uh, to write seriously for choir. Uh, and by that I mean not necessarily seeing the choir as an equivalent of the of, of the ensemble, the instrumental so ensemble. It's not, you, you're, I, I think some of the great modernist composers throughout the 20th century did write choral music, but they wrote it in an instrumentalist way. Uh, so in, in Schoenberg and Webern, wonderful works, but very, very uh, tricky to sing. And it's almost as if they're thinking of the voices as instruments. And um, 
I think what was needed was a, 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 a step change in thinking about what the choir does and how the choir operates and how the voice in a choir, voices in a choir uh, uh, operate at their best. And the rise of the British choir in particular uh, has, has set us free uh, in um, writing music that is appropriate for that tradition. Uh, and it has affected the style of the music that has come forward as well. It's certainly that has been the case for me. Uh, and now I'm trying things where I'm, I'm combining voices with instruments, combining choirs with orchestras. Um, <clears throat> but there's, uh, there will always be a great delight for me in getting back to the basics, as it were, and, and writing pure, uh, unaccompanied choral music like this is the basics for me.